I'd like to welcome everyone from wherever you're joining us from today. Uh, I'm Steve Zapala, and I'll be moderating this session. Uh, I've been practicing with Insight Meditation Community Washington, IMCW, for about 15 years and been a teacher for eight years. Uh, I benefited from the merits of this practice and enjoy learning more about and practicing through the Buddhist and recovery traditions. So on behalf of IMCW, we're happy to see those of you who are with us live, uh, knowing that many folks will be watching via the recording. Uh, welcome. This is the second Sunday Dharma series, and it's a fundraiser for IMCW. Uh, we gather on the second Sunday of every month to spend time getting to know an inspiring Dharma teacher uh, and their take on the state of the world through the lens of the Dharma. Uh, their own practice, and what is most important to them. In a moment, we're honored to be speaking with Kevin Griffin. Uh, Kevin teaches and reminds us that the Buddha said craving is the cause of suffering. Uh, linking this truth to an understanding of addiction and recovery has been the focus of Kevin's work for two decades. Uh, in this conversation, uh, we're going to invite people to explore their relationship to all kinds of craving, from the obvious ones like food and alcohol, the more subtle cravings for comfort, security, and control. So before we begin, uh, I want to let you know a few important details. Uh, also joining today is Miyako Donaweva, who is providing ASL interpretation. Thank you, Miyako. Really appreciate you being here. Um, may, uh, you may also select CC on the Zoom menu and to show the subtitle to start closed captioning. <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, coming up, you can find these on the IMCW website on next month, on August 8th, our wise friend Ruth, Crint, Ruth King will be in conversation with IMCW leadership, Tricia Stotler and La Sarmento, uh, as they share their personal experiences in working with Ruth's teachings on race and identity. Uh, the following month, on September 12th, teacher and author Shinzen Young uh, will be speaking with us on the topic from his book, The Science of Enlightenment. Um, during our time here together, we'll have uh, questions that you'll be able to submit. Uh, to do this, if you have questions for Kevin during our time together, uh, please put them in the chat. If you look at the chat, you'll see uh, a, a name marked questions here, questions here. Uh, please put them in there and we'll get to them as many as possible today. Uh, so let's get started a little bit about Kevin. Uh, Kevin Griffin is best known as the author of One Breath at a Time, uh, Buddhism and the 12 Steps. Uh, a longtime Buddhist practitioner and 12-step participant, he is the leader in the mindful recovery movement and one of the founders of the Buddhist Recovery Network. Kevin has trained with the leading Western Vipassana teachers, among them Jack Kornfield, Joseph Goldstein, Ajahn Amaro, uh, his teacher training was as a community Dharma leader at Spirit Rock Meditation Center in Marin County, California. He specializes in helping people in recovery connect with meditation and a progressive understanding of the 12 steps. His events range from evening classes to day-long workshops and longer silent retreats. And there's much more on his website if you're uh, able to take a look at that. So without further ado, uh, let's hear from Kevin. Kevin. Hi, Steve. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you for inviting me uh, to speak to your community. Uh, I actually have a long relationship with IMCW. A couple of my people who were in my teacher training were came from there and and I taught one of my very first day longs um, right after One Breath at a Time came out in, in Washington or the vicinity. Um, I, I first just will apologize that I'm, I'm getting over a cold. As soon as I took, start, stopped wearing a mask, I got a cold. So just warning to you folks out there, <laughs> there's still other diseases, maybe not deadly, but unpleasant. Uh, so, <clears throat> I may go into coughing convulsions at some point. Uh, I will try to mute myself in time for that. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm hoping this will be um, just a uh, kind of casual morning for us, uh, at least for those of us 
for whom it is morning. Uh, it could be a casual afternoon, a casual evening. Uh, you never know these days. Uh, I'm in California, so it's, uh, it's morning. So I thought we could just start with a short sit, uh, just for people to get uh, grounded and settled and present. So however you are sitting or lying down or standing, whatever posture, you might be walking if you're listening to a recording of this, just to bring attention into your body and feel how you are holding your body, whether in stillness or in movement. Well, we use sensations in the body as a starting point for meditation. There are always sensations present. And letting the body relax, softening, having a sense of releasing any tension. You might relax the jaw, release the shoulders, soften the belly. A sense of stillness, of calm, of ease. Noticing any sounds in your environment. So just a sense of beginning by just being aware of where you are and what you're feeling. Nothing special just arriving in the present moment. And then letting the attention come to rest on the breath. Feeling the breath either at the nostrils or the air touches the tip of the nose coming in and out. Or simply feeling the movement of belly rising and falling with each breath. The breath is always present, easy to connect with, and generally in a, a neutral experience, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. So letting the attention just rest with the breath. It's okay if the mind wanders, just gently bring it back to the breath when you notice that.
We can't force the mind to behave a certain way. Yet, if we bring a kind of kind intentionality, a gentle guidance, it tends to settle a bit. We're not striving for perfect silence or peace, just a kind of increased presence, awareness. So when um, I first heard from IMCW about doing this event, one of the things that appealed to me about it was that they s said it could be a, <clears throat> a kind of conversation um, and dialogue um, as opposed to just giving a you know, separate Dharma talk. So um, I think that's a nice way to to be able to talk about Dharma rather than just, um, you know, a bunch of information, but, uh, you know, exploration and reflection among people. So, so Steve and I'll start off talking a bit, and then uh, I think we're going to, hopefully we'll have some time for some other questions from people. So, Steve? Yeah. No, oh, thanks, Kevin. Kevin, uh, you often speak on the topic of uh, Dharma and recovery. And I've heard you talk about uh, craving and issues that affect uh, everyone. Um, so this may be somewhat broad, because uh, I know you have books written about this and uh, <laughs> do, do week-long meditation retreats on this topic. Uh, so in 
20 minutes to unpack this, I know is a lot, but I'm going to ask anyway. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk about the broad question of the connection uh, between the Dharma um, and recovery. Yeah. Is that, is that fair? It is. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good place to start to, uh, I, I, you know, people sometimes seem to think that <clears throat> I'm doing this kind of specialized uh, treatment program. <laughs> uh, you know, one of my, my uh, teaching colleagues who, who's also in recovery and does this work uh, and Vimala Sara Mason, John, um, she says, uh, the Dharma is the original treatment program. Uh, and, and the obvious connection is something you said in the introduction, which is that you know, the Buddha says that the cause of suffering is clinging. And what is addiction other than clinging? Uh, just might be the most extreme form of clinging, but, but we all experience it. And so it, it's always seemed to me that the 12 steps must have something to offer to Buddhism and Buddhism must have something to offer to the 12 steps since they are both really essentially confronting the same issue. Um, the, <clears throat> so, you know, when I say that, I don't, I don't mean to sort of trivialize addiction either, because there, there's a way in which people, some pe people in the maybe recovering addicts, maybe want to paint everybody with the same brush and say, everybody's an addict. So that sort of, yeah, you're addicted to your coffee or something. And, and it's not the same thing, because I, I identify addiction as something that besides being something that you do all the time that you're, you know, habitual with is also truly harmful to either you or to others or both. And, um, you know, so, so that some of the things that people talk about as, you know, I'm addicted to Netflix or something, you know, unless you're watching it 18 hours a day, probably not an addiction, but nonetheless, this exploration of clinging and the and the touching that feeling that uh, seeing the power of it uh, is is very informative to uh, practice um, as Buddhist practitioners um, and so let me go to kind of the other side a little bit to talk about the the connection for people in recovery. I think the most obvious thing that that draws people in recovery to to Buddhism is that, particularly the twelve steps, have this kind of theistic element. And it, there's a lot of there's actually six different ref steps that reference God in one way or another. And if if one is not uh, a believer, then it can seem really insurmountable to, to approach these steps without some, uh, you know, belief in a traditional like Christian or Abrahamic God. And so uh, Buddhism, I think, uh, can offer us a, a way into that. And I'll just say one more thing to sort of make that connection. The... <clears throat> the most direct way of thinking about, uh, you know, about a higher power, as it, the term is in the 12 steps in, in Buddhism is to think of the Dharma as a higher power. And, and the, the third step of the 12 steps says we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. And so we could say we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of the Dharma. And that then becomes a guiding principle in our lives. And that's something that's shared, of course, acro across Buddhist traditions and, and fits very well uh, because the Dharma really does provide guidance in so many aspects of our lives. So uh, maybe that's a start for how to answer that question. But as you say, it's, it winds up being um, 
a lot, there's a lot of uh, different elements to that. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Oh, there you go. I saw the mute button. Come on. Um, you know, the connection between the two traditions um, is often difficult you know, to see. And, you know, as a practitioner, I know a lot of times uh, I'm in groups with people that are uh, not in recovery and there's conversations between those terms, you know, that you just used on, on how it relates and how they, how they intersect and how we can find the, the commonalities. Uh, and, and I, and I think um, what I've heard you uh, mention too is uh, the importance of practicing and taking uh, this work uh, off the cushion, you know, how do we take this into the world and how do we, uh, how do we take our meditation practice into the world? Also in recovery, uh, we also have uh, important action steps uh, in order to take uh, our sobriety or recovery uh, into the world and prepare. Uh, can you share with us uh, maybe a little bit about the value and relationship of uh, action steps, so to speak, uh, in both mm -hmm. traditions, um, taking it off the cushion and you know, maybe the relationship to that in our meditation and mindfulness uh, practice or, or Buddhist uh, tradition, if that helps any. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, first of all, I think that sometimes Buddhism is seen as this kind of passive, or Buddhist meditation is seen as this kind of passive activity. Um, and that uh, we just do this separate thing and then then go on with our lives. And you know, a, a lot of a lot of times when people are introduced to Buddhism, what they're introduced to is meditation without sort of being introduced to the ethical component or the, the kind of issues around livelihood and speech. And they wind up with this very limited view of what what Dharma practice is. And, you know, in, in the recovery world, well, if there's an equivalent to that, it would be like for an alcoholic saying, all I have to do is stop drinking, you know, and, and with the 12 steps, we know like that's only the first step that there's a whole lot more because of the all the complexities of the personality and the, and the um, psychology of, of addiction. But what I th do think that, you know, it, it's pretty clear when you work the steps that there's much more than not drinking or using drugs or whatever your addiction might be, which uh, there are quite a few, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Um, and certainly for me, I, I guess it, it's easiest for me to talk about this in my own experience, which is that I actually got into Buddhist meditation before I got sober. and. Um, so I'm sort of describing myself, you know, that I was somebody who thought I could sort of meditate my problems away without really addressing uh, underlying issues. And my life did not improve uh, at all. In fact, it got worse at, at one point um, because I sort of had this, uh, you know, it's called a spiritual bypass, this, this delusion about how to... Um, how to change, how to, how to live in the world, that somehow there was a magical spiritual fix to the to life issues. So when I got sober, I started to realize that I'd been taking a, the wrong tack. <laughs> and, and from a Buddhist view, we can see this as I misunderstood karma, right? Uh, karma is af affected by our thoughts, by our words, and by our actions. And, I, and it was kind of like I thought that I could fix my karma just with thoughts, <laughs> and not bother with the actions or words. But, um, you know, I started to have to sort of deal on this very basic level with my life issues, everything from employment to relationships, um, which is probably the main the main things they talk about romance and finance uh, and and really kind of uh, re-envision how, how my life worked and 
eventually I came back around to the Dharma. I mean, I never really let it go, but it kind of got put more to the side. And when I came back around to the Dharma, I realized that was all there already, but I simply hadn't seen it because I had this misunderstanding about what Buddhism was, that it was just a meditation practice, you know, that it was not a whole life practice. And, and I think in recovery, I learned, oh, I really need to have a whole life practice. And then once I came back wholeheartedly to the Dharma, I saw, oh, that, that fits perfectly with the Dharma. And, um, and in fact, the, the principle, as you point to mindfulness, you know, which is really at the heart of Buddhist meditation and Buddhist teachings, mindfulness is the perfect tool for a whole life practice, because it's something that can be applied to every moment of existence. It can be applied to the mind, it can be applied to speech, it can be applied to action. We can apply it when we're exercising, when we can apply it when we're at work, we can you know, apply it in every kind of situation in our life. So, so the, as we know, this, this training to be a mindfulness practitioner, we start to see that it, it's something that can, we can carry with us in every activity. And, um, and then of course, you know, to kind of coming back to that question, we, we see that this is, uh, this gives us a way in and a, a practical way of applying the idea of really bringing, living a spiritual life and, and applying it both to, our, to what we would call more spiritual activity, but then to worldly activity with it that then gets informed with our spirituality. <laughs> I, I think that maybe answered the question. I, uh, uh, no, I can thank, tell at this point. Uh, no, thank you, Kevin. It's so many connections that I know that uh, it's often hard to, you know, keep track of the, the different words and then try to, to find that. That was really helpful. And one very similar to that that I often struggled with um, was in 12-step programs, we hear a lot about the word ego, you know, and sometimes we say the ego is not my amigo. <laughs> and, uh, and then we go to uh, um, the Buddhist framework of Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, and we start hearing a lot about self and no self. And I know that's a difficult concept uh, to unpack uh, in terms of uh, Anita and how to, how, well, how to do no self uh, and how that relates to the ego, maybe in terms of being able to balance those two, two traditions. Do you have some help, uh, some insight on maybe how to see that a little bit uh, that might, uh, might help us be able to balance uh, our understanding of that topic of no self or ego? Uh, how that might help in our uh, in our practice. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly the um, the term "no self" or "not self" is probably the most confusing one for people who come to Buddhism. In some ways, I think it's better to think of us as having many selves, and that just none of them are the are you <laughs> like that you, you can't sort of name one as being the, the essential you um but to, to go you know, i mean it's it's this is another place where there's an interesting intersection between dharma and recovery in in the again in the 12-step literature it says that self-centeredness was our problem and, but it also has this concept of anonymity, which people take to mean, don't, don't let people know who you are. Mm. And, but, but one of the traditions you're probably familiar with says that anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions. And that idea is something that I think is actually pointing to that the idea of not self that and here, see if you can follow me here. You know, many people, when they're sort of faced with the idea of like, you know, you should, you're an alcoholic or you're an addict, you need to go to a program, don't want to take on that identity of I'm an addict or I'm an alcoholic. 
like they might feel they have a problem, but they don't want to, they feel like, oh, that I don't label myself. But what I think is happening when you go into a meeting and say, my name's Kevin and I'm an alcoholic, is that you are actually letting go of identity. You're letting go of the identity of who you are outside that room. And you're just becoming one of this group, which makes you even less special <laughs> and less unique. You're just one of this crowd. Uh, and so I really see that as letting go of self or letting go of, of kind of um, a unique identity and just becoming sort of a generic identity. Um, and so, uh, you know, whereas, yeah, of course, in, in Buddhism, you know, it's not that the Buddha said there was no self, but, but he just said anything you can point to is not yourself. And it, he wasn't trying to start a debate on this question or prove a point. What he was really trying to do, as I understand it, was free you of the problem of being attached to some idea of self and all the baggage that comes with that, all the worries, all, all the ways that we try to protect ourselves or, and you know, look good and feel good about who we are and the, the whole story we have about ourselves, all of that is like, you know, all of that stuff just creates more dukkha, more suffering for you. Just let that go. Don't, you don't, you know, just stay present with your mo present moment experience. And whether there's a self or not, won't really be a, a problem for you, you know. Um, so I think what we're, what we're getting at here isn't a philosophical idea or a metaphysical idea. Is there a self or isn't there a self? What does this mean? But rather, as with mindfulness, what's going on in this moment about identity? And how is it bringing either freedom or suffering to me in this moment? You know, am I making problems for myself, you know. Here I am, Kevin Griffin, you know, author, teacher, you know, there's, what does, I see 184 people, not counting me, 183 people on this call. What do they think about me? How am I doing? Do they like me? Are they going to buy my book? You know, oh, well, I can turn this into suffering, right? I'm here to be of service, you know, not, not create suffering for myself or for anyone else. But, and yet the mind will do that, right? The mind will all of a sudden, how do I look? Uh, let me, let me put myself on speaker view so I can really see, oh, do I have a, do I have some lotion stuck on my face? Oh, people are going to think I'm an idiot. You know, just, we see how just, you know, Ajahn Sumedho, a wonderful Buddhist monk puts it most succinctly when he says, Whenever I think about myself, I get depressed. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. That's great, Kevin. Uh, thank you so much. It's, uh, you know, another word I think you kind of used in there is our, in our, our will too. In, in the 12 step programs, that word will uh, comes up a lot. Our will uh, and letting go of our will, almost like a, 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 if you said will as it relates to our concept that you so well described of, of ego and, and no ego. And then you touched on, on your last question, uh, question about God and that term, if, we, if it's not our will, then we say, uh, we potentially say God's will. But in my, one way, I guess what I heard you say is uh, you don't have to call it God's will. You could just know that it's not anything that's not our will is something else, right? So uh, I don't have to uh, maybe believe in God. I just have to know that I'm not God. And maybe that will, maybe that will help a little bit. Uh, to turn it over at some level. That's often like, you know, I hear that as a starting point in the 12 step world. And, and it seems like a pretty good starting point. It's like, yeah, I'm not God. 
because so much of addiction is about control. It's about controlling how I feel. It's about controlling other people. Um, and, you know, we wind up, of course, out of control. Uh, step one says our lives have become unmanageable. Uh, that's because we're, we're trying so hard to control that we lose control, ironically uh, 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 enough. Um, but I, I, so from a Buddhist viewpoint, I think the, the correlation I can make with will is, is with right intention. And, and so as opposed to, you know, aligning your will with God, which is, uh, frankly, it's just like a, I never really understood what that meant because I don't know who, what God wants or, but, but um, in Buddhism, right intention said, it gives us pretty clear instructions for how to align ourselves with the Dharma. And if we can see the Dharma as being more powerful than us, it's not so much that, oh, like a God that, controls us, but it's rather that they're, we're having a relationship with this power, which I think is a more realistic description of most people's lives, that we know that there are kind of rules in the world. There are both, you know, uh, worldly rules and kind of spiritual rules. Uh, and, and then we make choices as to whether we are going to uh, behave according to those rules or whether we're going to try to get around them or ignore them. Uh, so, uh, for instance, everything is impermanent, but I don't want to get older, so I'm going to get some plastic surgery so I don't look older. But of course, I'm still older, you know, I didn't, nothing actually happened. It was a delusion that I was, I'm not, and when people say, oh, you don't look as old as you are, I'm always like, yes, but I am that old. <laughs> That's just the way it is. How I look is not different from reality. So this kind of idea that we're uh, cooperating with the Dharma and, and then in order to do that, I want to find out well, what is right intention and you know, how do I follow the Eightfold Path? That's, this is why we study the Dharma to try to, to, try to actually uh, make our behavior align with, uh, with the Dharma, but our behavior both internally and externally. Um, so so I'm not sure that will and intention are quite the same thing, but it's the closest kind of correlation that I can make with that. Um, and it really is about letting go of my preferences. You know, um, I have that uh, over there on my wall, there's a, a little um, uh, painting that has the, the words of the Sinsing Ming, the verses of the faith mind that start out, uh, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. Um, and that, that's uh, words to live by, as they say. <laughs> um, well, I, I feel I'm rambling a bit, but uh, I, I'm going to blame it on the uh, multiple uh, forms of uh, cold medicine that I'm taking. It's good to have an excuse this morning. Usually I don't have an excuse. It's just but we, but my we rambling. Know. But we know, but we know you're not addicted to any of those. So that's we're, we're good shape. <laughs> oh Lord, no, I'm I'm not addicted to, you know, expectorant. <laughs> Kevin, um, I don't. Uh, if it's okay, we are receiving some questions over the chat. Um, and and I apologize to those that have asked a question. If I'm jumping down, I think some of what you asked already may have been answered by Kevin. So I'm going to read one here, Kevin. If you're ready for this one. You bet. Uh, we're about you now we think we got about a little over 20 about 20 minutes and just want to make sure we leave enough time uh this comes from uh key burns uh she says i'm curious if you could explain how the forgiveness practices forgiveness and heart practices help with trauma along with the concentration and focus of the mind um 
There's a little mm. more here that might help with that, Kevin. The mental formations of our self arising out of trauma creates so much separation. And I'm curious about the perspective of action taken with wise effort regarding boundaries, changing relationships, recognizing uh, a unique being of addiction doesn't mean one allows uh, any type of verbal or physical abuse. So uh, a lot there, uh, maybe focusing back in on the forgiveness practices and hard practices um, to help focus the mind. Yeah. Yeah, that, well, uh, actually, I appreciate that the question brought in the, uh, the idea of kind of concentration, but let me just first see if I can address a little bit the idea of forgiveness. And I mean, there's so much there. There's a, there's a lot that can be said about forgiveness. And I'm, so I'm not going to try to give like, uh, say everything there could be said about it. But, but I want to kind of pick up on something I'm already talking about, which is to see how the teaching on not self can relate to to forgiveness and not to say oh there's no self for, so there's nobody to be forgiven which is kind of like a <laughs> shortcut but maybe not uh, a, a truly honest one but rather seeing that there is nothing unique in me you know that that uh, that I am just another human being, another flawed human being, and that uh, that every flawed human being, which means every human being, harms, does harm at some point to others and to themselves, and that most of <clears throat> the guilt or shame we might have around that is, is actually uh, ego, you know, it's, it's um, in, in one sense, making ourselves really special because we are especially bad, you know, uh, that what we did is uniquely unforgivable. So that's, that's a kind of ego. Um, and so, so as I reflect on forgiveness, I often try to do it with this kind of idea of seeing myself as just one of this mass of humanity and just seeing, oh, wow, like humans. Um, and in that, there is a touching, but there there's a touching of the of the pain of this of the self pain. You know the pain of not forgiving, and feeling that. When we are able to bring this quality of mindfulness, to, the feeling, of, of lack of forgiveness that pain, then we're we're actually creating some distance, the mindfulness can be this container, you know, as, as Tara uh, it says so beautifully, bringing loving awareness. So this is so important in mindfulness practice that it's not just a sort of flat, dry knowing, but it's actually, there's a softness and a gentleness to the knowing. So knowing the pain and holding the pain with suffering then we're changing our relationship to it from that is me and I am bad to, oh, there is suffering here. There, someone is suffering. How do I respond to suffering with care, with, with kindness, with compassion, with forgiveness? The, uh, I'll add then this kind of the point about concentration, the, What's interesting is that when we work with the formal forgiveness practices, uh, 
as well as the loving kindness and compassion practices, which are all really interrelated. When we work with them, it gives us a very structured way of meditating. And, and I, I'm kind of guessing, I don't know if that's what this question was connecting to, that it, this can be very impactful, that when we develop, uh, when we work with these very structured practices, it helps the mind to stay focused. Like the mind is uh, more willing to stay focused when we give it very specific uh, instructions about how to meditate. And as we do that, the concentration itself has a healing effect. The, there's a softening that happens. And we call it concentration, but it's not a good really term for the experience, which is more of an experience of peace and embodiment. And that, that that calm that arises then, that in itself has a healing impact that's more felt rather than thought. So, it, so the forgiveness in that moment is happening through the body, a kind of uh, somatic forgiveness that just allow that that softening uh, just in the way that when we pick up a crying baby and hold it with love and the baby starts to settle that that the the love they're feeling nothing is happening to make them stop crying except that they're feeling love and they're feeling safety and so we we feel that ourselves with with our own practice when we work like this. So it's one of the reasons why concentration or samadhi is so precious because it has a naturally healing healing quality that doesn't require a cognitive sort of change of like figuring out, oh, I'm okay, I shouldn't, you know, I forgive myself. Okay, that's just a thought, right? But, but the actual felt experience. Whew. Um, as you were speaking, Kevin, uh, about concentration and uh, how, how that related to uh, forgiveness practices and heart practices, it, it occurred to me that uh, in 12 steps, we often hear a lot about um, um, the word serenity or the serenity prayer. And I know we didn't uh, talk too much about this, but I'm wondering if uh, maybe perhaps, you know, for those of you in the audience who have heard uh, the prayer, real briefly, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, uh, packs a lot of meaning and is a, is a mantra for a lot of 12-step programs, if not all of them, uh, and really, really packs a lot of uh, help in there and support. Kevin, um, can you relate that or help us uh, tie that to uh, Buddhism and our, our, our meditation mindfulness practice in a way that, you know, we going back to uh, our sanghas and communities with recovery people uh, that might help us better understand or relate uh, either, either the Buddhist side to the recovery side or the recovery side to the Buddhist side, a little bit about uh, the, the wisdom in that, in that prayer or in that reflection. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a great, a great thing to talk about. Um, the, I mean, first of all, the, you know, the, the beginning of the prayer, grant me the serenity to accept things I cannot change. I guess, for me, that's like 90% of the prayer <laughs> of how it, uh, uh, how it works. And it, Certainly early in my recovery, that, that got me through a lot of difficult situations. But, you know, as you're suggesting, we also run into this idea in the Dharma. It, it's not actually a word that I've ever seen in the early Buddhist texts, acceptance. But, um, but certainly in the RAIN practice, which probably most of the people here are familiar with, recognize, accept, investigate, nurture. Oh, our neighbor's dog is awake. Uh, um, you know, it's seen as kind of a critical element of 
of our practice. And, and really acceptance is implied in mindfulness because a key element of mindfulness beyond just the bare attention, you know, just being aware of the object, you know, whether it's the breath or another person or the dog barking, a, a key, there's the bare awareness of that, but then there's the, what's the response to that? And with mindfulness, we are watching whether there's a reaction of aversion or craving or ignoring, because it's those things, it's those reactions that lead to the dukkha, to the suffering that create the problems for us. So if we can see with bare attention what's happening and then notice the arising of the response, we can let that go and, and not be carried away into that. So what we can see is that one of the kind of connections that I make between Dharma and recovery, if, we, if you want to take acceptance as kind of a, a recovery term, that it actually connects to the Buddhist concept of equanimity. Acceptance leads to equanimity or acceptance is sort of an aspect of equanimity. And equanimity is this balanced mind, the non-reactive, undisturbed, serene mind. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting that um, the serenity prayer, it has a balancing quality to it because it's saying on the one hand, accept things that you can't change. On the other hand, don't just be passive. If there are things that are happening that need to be dealt with, respond skillfully. And the way you will know which is which is if you can bring some wisdom. Uh, you know, of course, the, the prayer is phrased as many prayers are as a, uh, a request, <laughs> uh, a petitionary prayer to God, please grant me the serenity. But, but um, you know, most people, I believe, take the prayer to be a cue for self-examination, a cue to ask themselves, ah, am I, am I trying to change something that I can't change? Or I am, am I avoiding dealing with something that I don't want to deal with? I need to reflect on this. I need to think carefully. So uh, it's not that God is going to tell me <laughs> or give me <laughs> the serenity or grant me the serenity. I think uh, my own capacity for wisdom is going to um, give me the clarity to, to see that. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, we know that uh, a lot of what you just talked about suggests uh, an inward, you know, an inward uh, approach to problems versus my happiness being dependent upon outside sources. Um, you know, what I can change, it sounded like what you were saying, is uh, the only thing I can change is me, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, I wonder if that's what you meant. Well... I, I mean, I also do mean it on a practical level that sometimes I'm, I am literally avoiding dealing with the problem because I don't want to face it, you know, because I, and, you know, I don't have the courage to face it. You know, like I don't want to call that person or I don't want to show up for that meeting or, or you know, I won't, don't want to deal with that problem. So there's that, but, but clearly, yeah, the, all of it springs out of the internal experience as you're pointing to, because my resistance is internal. You know, my, my fear, you know, my lack of courage is something that is an internal experience that has to be dealt with. Um, and, and yeah, certainly the place that's so important for all of us, I think I can safely say is, is our reactivity, our lack of acceptance, and um, 
you know, I remember years ago having an experience of um, around my relationship with my wife that, you know, at one time I thought, you know, I, I kind of went through a process. <laughs> Early on in our relationship, I thought, you know, she needs to change. <laughs> And then if she would change and be the way I want her to be, things would be great. And then eventually, you know, we got into some counseling and I thought, you know, we, we need to change. You know, we, we, if we both change and we're willing to change, then things will be, you know, that'll uh, solve our problems. And then one day I had a revelation. Oh, if I change, <laughs> then everything gets taken care of. Uh, and... And what, what I discovered then was that if I change, she changes. Uh, because naturally, she's going to respond differently to me if I stop acting like an idiot or something along those lines. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think you're, you're pointing to an important point that uh, if we take care of our own side of the street, um, you know, most, most other problems get uh, taken care of. Uh, thank you, Kevin. To look to look inward. It's uh, I know we often talk about the fingers, one pointing forward and three back. So mm. uh, we look at we look at that. Um, I'm looking at the questions, Kevin, on the chat that I'm getting. Uh, there's not many others. If anyone has a question, please uh, pass it to that spot. Um, I do want to uh, ask uh, Kevin um, another question or two, but I also want to make sure I honor anyone else that wants to ask something here. Kevin, um, um, I would like to leave some time. We have 10 minutes uh, for you to, to share on anything you'd like to share on if it wasn't addressed already. Um, the only area that I think I wanted to kind of bring up next uh, as an idea uh, is really the our terms of Sangha uh, and community um, in in our mindfulness and meditation communities and our sanghas, the importance and value of that, kind of as it relates to uh, what what we do in twelve step programs and meetings and in uh, in communities, um, you know, the importance, I guess, the importance of importance of sangha uh, in both worlds, in both communities, um, as it relates to recovery and practicing presence and practicing awareness and and change. Well, would you be okay to comment on that? We have uh, we have ten minutes, Kevin. So um, after, if you do address that or not, if you'd like to offer some final words before we end in ten minutes, that would be great. Yeah, yeah really, really good uh, thing to get into. When I started to practice, which is forty years ago, uh, there was such an emphasis just on meditation, and it didn't seem like there was much emphasis on sangha or community, which is sangha is the word for community in Buddhism. And so it was a very sort of isolating, it could be very isolating. Um, and when I got sober, of course, that was all about community, all about going to meetings and having a sponsor and having friends and sort of living in this, in this supportive community and and indeed that's you know the the researchers the addiction researchers say that that's one of the really important elements of anybody's recovery is to have a community it's very hard to stop uh, addictive behavior alone um, but yeah eventually <laughs> i started to hear some other teachings <laughs> there's one where the buddha says the whole of the holy life is noble friends and noble conversation. And, and I think as I was sort of changing my view around that, I started to see that a lot of teachers started to bring in much more emphasis on community. So things like Kalyanamita, which I know is a very popular in the IMCW. Um, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's hard to be a solo meditator. I mean, it's one thing to meditate on your own, but to but to live the life, uh, uh, it's hard to do that alone. And and we we all need community and support. I mean, w when we think of monks, you know, there's just sometimes an idea of like a, a monk alone in a cave or something. But 
monastics live in community that's all about a, a supportive community, particularly the Thai forest tradition, very much based in that. So it's, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, this is not an individual practice uh, and that it's really, uh, it really depends upon, upon community. Um, there's, there's some really beautiful suttas that talk about this and all the kind of layering of support that one gets from a community that then makes it possible for one to have the breakthrough. I mean, even the Buddha's life, you know, other than the sh relatively short time that he went off to practice alone, he was in community as he was a, on the path. And then he had his awakening and he went, he went back into community. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the foundation. I see there's a question in the chat that I'm. Yeah, uh, let's, I don't know. You want to pick it up, Kevin, feel free. Um, I can read it to you if you'd like, either way. Do you have advice for how to listen to advice? <laughs> that uh, that sounds like that could be, for instance, from one sponsor that's heavily couched in God language. Yeah, well, that's a good question. Well, uh, another teacher friend of mine who, uh, you know, does some of this work talks about the, the universal translator, which I think was something from Star Trek that could like translate any language. And so she talks about, um, you know, you know, developing uh, an internal translator. Uh, and, and that's certainly what I've done. Uh, I actually have a, a piece in my book, One Breath at a Time, where I go through the Lord's Prayer and talk about it uh, in Dharma terms. So I think, you know, my fundamental belief is that if we are talking about the truth, if, what, if what's being expressed is true, then it must make sense through through any spiritual lens that is also true. So if Buddhism is true and 12-step recovery is true, if they are both holding elements of truth, then there must be a correlation. So it, for, for, for me, it's about finding those correlations, which again, requires a certain amount of sort of study. You know, that's, that's something that I maybe, I don't know if it gets, doesn't get emphasized, but I, but I think it, I like to emphasize it a bit, like it's really useful to particularly study the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and to understand them. Those, those core teachings, which include all the teachings on mindfulness, and then the teachings on loving kindness, compassion, forgiveness, you know, if, and, and really, because you can get lost in Buddhist teachings because there's a lot out there, right? But if you kind of focus around those major elements, then when someone speaks to you about something, you can pretty much kind of place it, oh, that kind of fits with this as I do, like, oh, they're talking about the will of God. Okay, right intention, I can do that, you know. A moment of clarity, oh, that's kind of like right view, okay you know, acceptance. Oh, that's kind of like equanimity. So you, you start to make these connections. I mean, uh, of course, that's a lot of what my work is. So, you know, if you want to read my books, <laughs> you get a, a primer on how to approach this. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, let's see, we probably have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, there's a question here on, on the chat uh, here from Karen B, Amanda. Are there um, more, this is a little bit more pragmatic uh, administrative, Kevin, and I, and I think if we go to the website, we'll find it. Uh, but are there online or in-person sanghas for people practicing the 12 steps in Buddhism? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, there's an organization called the Buddhist Recovery Network. And the Buddhist Recovery Network is a very loose organization that's mostly a website that provides this kind of uh, information. So there are a lot of meetings that are listed on there they're listed there geographically. So if you go to buddhistrecovery.org, uh, you can find that. There's also a couple of other programs, something called Recovery Dharma, 
and refuge recovery. Those are actually closely related that recovery dharma came out of refuge recovery. Uh, there's also a program called eight step recovery, which is not related to the 12 steps. It's a different steps, but it's a, it's more or less a mindfulness and harm reduction uh, program. Actually, Vimala Sara, who I mentioned earlier, uh, originated that. So yeah, there, there are quite a few uh, resources. Uh, Buddhist recovery website is a good place to start because they, they kind of um, bring together a lot of the different options there. Mm -hmm. I also, and I'll mention that I'm, I've been teaching uh, online for the la since last March, March of 2020. And so uh, if you go to my website, which is kevingriffin.net, um, I have a Tuesday morning and a Friday evening class each week. And I've, it's, it's very casual. Uh, we sit for a little while and I, I've been going through one breath at a time uh, there. Yeah. Kevin, um, we have about a minute or two. Would you like to add anything before uh, we're going to start to wind down a little bit? Just thank you, Steve. And thank you to all the support staff from uh, IMCW, the volunteers and the staff. I really appreciate you having me and, and all the work you're doing. This is such a vibrant community. And, and thanks to Tara for her inspiration in leading this, this community. Mm. It's really one of the most vibrant Buddhist communities probably in the world, certainly in, in North America. Mm. So really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Kevin. I'm gonna, we're going to ask if you'd like, I'm going to make a quick comment or two. And, and if you'd like to, to close us in a second with a, a uh, we had on the schedule, maybe a, a two minute closing meditation, if that's all right after yeah. uh, Kevin, uh, and I'm not even going to try to summarize everything he said. It was a lot and was really, really helpful. Uh, I, just to highlight really one thing I'd like to say is I really appreciate what you said about changing our relationship you know, to our experience. And as he, as you made the point of taking it off the cushion and how important it is to take it into our daily lives and not to show up for peace, but to practice working with our distractions when we show yeah. up and, and then how valuable that is. That's such a great message. And I really, really appreciate that. And all your time on trying to help us understand the, how the words come together. So uh, Kevin, um, I'll, I'm going to... Um, just say in closing, you know, we appreciate everyone's I know, presence today. Uh, and before we before we end, would you uh, please um, be kind enough to just take us out in the meditation? Sure, I'd be happy to. So just settling back again, maybe closing your eyes or just lowering your gaze. And take a moment to feel your own tenderness. Can you soften and allow that, allow yourself to feel that? Can you bring an attitude of kindness and acceptance to your own tenderness? knowing that I have this tenderness within. I know that all beings are tender. All beings want care and love, safety and peace. So I offer this to all beings in the words of the Buddha, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies, 
and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will. One should sustain this recollection. Hmm. Now, Kevin, we were truly fortunate to have you here today. And I, on behalf of IMCW, and, and really want to thank you. Uh, I hope you can feel our appreciation. And if anything else we can do to show you that, please, please let us know. Uh, I appreciate everyone's presence here today and the generosity in supporting IMCW second Sunday Dharma series fundraiser. Uh, the recording of this event will be emailed to all registered within the week. And for those that are in 12-step programs, um, we won't have a half time. So there, there are dues and fees, uh, but we do have expenses. So we won't pass the basket today. But uh, that's uh, part of our uh, work here today is fundraising. And uh, for those of you familiar with the 12-step language as well, uh, more to be revealed. So uh, hang in there. And uh, Kevin, uh, thank you so much again. And I wish everyone a, a wonderful day. If we didn't get to your questions, I truly apologize. And um, maybe we can find another way to, to connect. So hope you all have a lovely rest of your Sunday. Great. Thanks so much, Steve. Welcome. All right. So long, everybody. <laughs> Bye, Kevin. Bye.